In this video, we're going to talk about centers, centralizers, and normalizers. These come up a lot in group theory, and they provide us with important examples of subgroups of certain groups. First of all, let's take a look at the definitions. If G is a group, then the center of G, which is denoted by Z of G, is the set of all elements little g and G with the property that for any H in G, GH is H times G. In other words, the center of G is the set of all elements of G which commute with every other element of G. Next, if S is any subset of the group G, then the centralizer of S in G, denoted by C sub G of S, is the set of all G's in G with the property that GS is SG for every S in S. In other words, the centralizer of S and G is the set of all elements of G which commute with every element of S. And finally, the normalizer of S and G, denoted by N sub G of S, is the set of all elements G and G with the property that GS G inverse is equal to S. Remember that, as introduced in the previous video, the notation GS G inverse denotes the set of all elements of the form G times little s times G inverse, where little s runs through the set S. Now, let's make a few basic observations about these sets. First of all, you may have already noticed that the center of G is always a subset of the centralizer of S and G, because the requirement for G to be an element of the center is that it has to commute with everything in G. So if S is any subset of G and G is any element of the center, it's also definitely going to be an element of the centralizer of S and G. Secondly, it's not difficult to see that for any set S and G, the centralizer of S and G is a subset of the normalizer of S and G. And to see why that's true, suppose that little g is any element of the centralizer of S and G. Then by definition, G commutes with every element of S. So for any S and S, GS is S times G. But right multiplying this equation by G inverse gives that GS G inverse is S. And so, by the definition of GS G inverse, and using the fact that G times little s G inverse is S for every S and S, we see that this set is precisely equal to S. This shows that every element of the centralizer of S and G also qualifies to be an element of the normalizer of S and G, so that the centralizer is contained in the normalizer. Another pretty easy observation here is that the center of G is equal to the centralizer of G and G, and you can see that right away just by comparing the two definitions here. Next, it's also easy to see, since the identity element in any group commutes with every other element of the group, that the identity element is always an element of the center of any group. And next, if you have any group G in any subgroup H of G, then to say that H is a normal subgroup of G is exactly the same as saying that the normalizer of H and G is equal to all of G. That follows directly from the definition of normal subgroup, together with the equivalent conditions for normality that we proved in the previous video. And finally, if G is an abelian group, then everything commutes with everything else. So it's trivially true that the center of G is all of G. And because of the containments that we've already proven, that forces C sub G of S and N sub G of S to equal G for every subset S of G. So in the abelian case, there's nothing interesting going on with these definitions. The main theorem that I want to prove for you in this video is that for any group G and for any subset S of G, the center of G is always a subgroup of the centralizer of S and G, which is always a subgroup of the normalizer of S and G, which is always a subgroup of G. Keep in mind that we've already proved that as sets, each one of these sets is contained in the set to the right of it. So the only thing that we really need to prove here is that the center, the centralizer, and the normalizer are all subgroups of G. We'll start by proving that the normalizer of any set S and G is a subgroup of G. And to do that, we'll use the subgroup criteria. So first of all, we want to prove that the normalizer of any set in G is not empty. But remember that we said that for any group G, the identity is an element of the center, and the center is a subset of the normalizer. So the identity element is an element of the normalizer of S and G for any group G and for any subset S and G, which means that the normalizer is always non-empty. Next, we want to show that the normalizer is closed under multiplication. So let's suppose that G and H are two elements of N sub G of S, and let's think about what happens when we conjugate the set S by the element GH. By definition, we get the set of all elements of the form GH times S times GH inverse where S runs through S. And using the fact that GH inverse is H inverse times G inverse, together with the generalized associative law, we can write that as the set of all elements of the form G times HSH inverse G inverse, where S runs through the set S. But now the fact that H is an element of the normalizer of S and G means that as S runs through S, the set of all elements of the form HSH inverse also runs through all the elements of S. So that this set is precisely the same as GS G inverse, 
which again, since g is in the normalizer of s and g, we know is equal to s. This shows that the conjugate of the set s by the element gh is again the set s, so it implies that gh is an element of the normalizer of s and g so that the normalizer is closed under multiplication. Finally, to prove that the normalizer is closed under taking inverses, let's suppose that g is any element of the normalizer so that g times s times g inverse is equal to s. Now what we'd like to show is that g inverse times s times g is equal to s, and this step is a tiny bit trickier than the previous steps. We're going to show that g inverse sg is equal to s by first showing that s is a subset of that set and then showing the reverse inclusion. So first of all, for any element little s and s, the fact that g s g inverse is equal to s means that little g times little s times g inverse is equal to s prime for some s prime in the set s, and left multiplying by g inverse and then right multiplying by g gives that g inverse s prime g is equal to s. Well, that shows that s is an element of the set g inverse s g, so it gives us the inclusion that the set s is a subset of the set g inverse times s g. Now, to show the reverse inclusion, let's suppose that s is any element of s. Well then, again, using the fact that g s g inverse is equal to s, there must exist an element s prime in s with the property that g times s prime times g inverse is equal to s. And now left multiplying by g inverse and right multiplying by g gives that g inverse sg is equal to s prime. So this shows that if we start from any element little s and s and we conjugate it by g inverse, we land back in s. And that gives us the reverse inclusion that g inverse sg is a subset of s. Now that we have both of these inclusions, we conclude that g inverse sg is equal to s, and that's the same as saying that g inverse is an element of the normalizer of s and g. So that proves that the normalizer is closed under taking inverses. Finally, since we have a subset of our group which is non-empty, closed under multiplication, and closed under taking inverses, we can conclude immediately from the subgroup criterion that the normalizer of S and G is in fact a subgroup of G. Next, let's prove that the centralizer of S and G is a subgroup of the normalizer of S and G. As previously mentioned, we already know that the centralizer is a subset of the normalizer, so we just want to show that the centralizer is a group. And as before, we can do that using the subgroup criteria. So just as before, the identity is an element of the center, which is a subset of the centralizer, which means that the identity is an element of the centralizer so that the centralizer is non-empty. Next, to show that the centralizer is closed under multiplication, let's suppose that g and h are two elements of the centralizer of s and g. Then for any element little s and s, when we multiply g h times s by the associative law that's equal to g times h s, and by the fact that h is an element of the centralizer of s and g, that's equal to g times s h. But now, by the associative law again, I can write that as g times s times h, and by the fact that g is an element of the centralizer of s and g, g times s is s times g, so this is s g times h, which is s times g h. Well, that's exactly the requirement for g h to be an element of the centralizer of s and g, so that shows that the centralizer is closed under multiplication. Finally, to show that the centralizer is closed under taking inverses, let's suppose that g is any element of the centralizer of s and g. Then, for any s and s, we know that g times s is s times g, and left multiplying both sides of this equation by g inverse, and then right multiplying both sides of the equation by g inverse, gives that s times g inverse is equal to g inverse times s. So if g commutes with s, then g inverse also commutes with s, and if this is true for every s and s, then we get that g inverse is an element of the centralizer of s and g. That shows that the centralizer of any set is closed under taking inverses, and by the subgroup criteria, it completes the proof that the centralizer of s and g is a subgroup of the normalizer. And finally, to see why the center is a subgroup of the centralizer of s and g for any s, we've already shown that for any s, the center of g is a subset of the centralizer of s and g, and we also remarked that the center of g is the centralizer of g and g, which we know as a special case of what we've just proved is a subgroup of g. Therefore, we immediately have that the center of g is a subgroup of the centralizer of s and g for any s. That completes the proof of this theorem. Let's conclude this video by taking a look at a few examples. And for our examples, let's work with the group of quaternions. So first of all, what's the center of this group? Well, by the definition of multiplication in the quaternions, the element negative 1 commutes with every other element of this group, so we know that negative 1 is an element of the center of this group. On the other hand, i and j don't commute, and neither do i and k, so that implies right away that none of these elements or their negatives are elements of the center. Well, that means that the center of the quaternion group is just the group consisting of the identity and negative 1. Next, let's compute the centralizers and normalizers of a couple sets. 
And first of all, let's compute the centralizer of the group generated by the element i. Remember, the centralizer of the group generated by i is the set of everything in the quaternions that commutes with everything in this group. Now, everything in this group is a power of i, and i certainly commutes with any power of i. So that guarantees that i is an element of the centralizer of the group generated by i. But if i is an element of this group, then the group generated by i must also be a subset of the centralizer. On the other hand, neither j nor k commute with i, so neither plus or minus j or plus or minus k are elements of the centralizer, and that right away tells us that the centralizer of the group generated by i is the group generated by i. And how about the normalizer of this group in Q8? Well, we already proved in the previous video that every subgroup of the quaternion group is a normal subgroup. So by our basic observations about the definition of the normalizer, that means that the normalizer of the group generated by i is all of Q8. Now let's look at another example, and this time let's try to compute the centralizer in this group of the set consisting just of the elements i and j. First of all, by the theorem that we proved, the center of this group is a subgroup of the centralizer of any set. So that tells us right away that plus and minus 1 are elements of the centralizer of this set. And secondly, because j doesn't commute with i and i doesn't commute with j, and because k doesn't commute with i, None of the elements plus or minus i, plus or minus j, or plus or minus k are in the centralizer of this set. So in this case, the centralizer of the set consisting of just the elements i and j is just the group consisting of plus or minus 1. And finally, how about the normalizer of this set? Well, we know that the centralizer is a subgroup of the normalizer, so that tells us that plus and minus 1 are elements of the normalizer of the set. Now, to decide whether or not plus or minus i are elements of the normalizer, let's think about what happens when we conjugate the element j by the element i. Using the rules for working with quaternions, first I can multiply the i and j together, which gives me k, and then I can multiply the k and the i together, which gives me j, and I conclude that the conjugate of j by i is negative j, but negative j is not an element of the original set. Now, it would be essentially the same calculation if I replaced i by negative i here, since negative 1 commutes with everything, so the two negative 1s would come out front and multiply together to give a 1. So I can conclude, based on this calculation, that plus and minus i are not elements of the normalizer of this set. Now, a very similar argument shows that plus and minus j and plus and minus k are also not elements of the normalizer of this set. So that leaves me with the conclusion in this case that the normalizer of this set is the group consisting of the elements plus or minus 1. Okay, well, that's the end of this video. Thank you for watching. In the next video, finally, we're going to get to talking about quotient groups.